Hi guys, welcome to part two of the Hot Pot Podcast episode with Molly Deakin and Hira Jamil. Uh, in the first half, we were talking all things mental health and awareness and all the bits and pieces which might help young dentists in the UK especially, but across the world as well. If you've been enjoying what we've been up to, you can have a little look at the link in my bio. You can have a look for one of these mugs if you're watching on YouTube. Uh, and if you're interested in a little bit of something different, we have the Patreon group, which is just less than a coffee a month and helps me start to improve the quality of the bits and pieces I'm doing here on the Hot Pot Podcast and on Dentsminster. But that's all very boring stuff. Uh, let's get back into it. Uh, part two, we're going to we're going to switch lanes a little bit. We're going to talk a bit more generally, a bit less dental, um, but we'll start off with more current events. So, guys, the world has been turned upside down. How have you personally coped with the COVID situations? Anyone can dive in. Go on, I'll let you go first, Molly. <laughs> okay, so personally, before we went into the covid lockdown i was probably in a bit of like a a state myself i was over committing to everything like just saying yes i had three jobs um I, you know i was doing dentistry and then i was doing a, a lacrosse job on the side like a coaching job uh, i was doing all my things with bda and it was just a lot like living away from my family going home to visit them my friend lives out uh, like in london and i'm in nottingham so you know, it was too much. And before the lockdown happened, I just decided I just need to work out what needs to stay and what needs to go. So for me, lockdown has been the per the perfect opportunity. I have just got rid of all the stuff that I don't actually enjoy doing, like all the stuff that doesn't work for me with my like goals and ambitions. And I've re kind of recentered myself around like I actually wrote down some goals that I would like to achieve and where I see myself in five years. And that's just really given me the opportunity to just kind of like knuckle down and get on with it. And one of the things that I've been neglecting was fitness and health and just kind of committing to all these other things and not giving myself time for me. So in lockdown, I've, I've got myself a little gym in the back garden, got some weights out there. I've got like agility ladders resistance bands you name it we've got it out there and it is absolutely like it's brill it is the best thing i think i've ever done like really like you can just not be bothered to go out do 20 minutes and come back and you know you just feel so much better about everything just getting fresh air you know yeah i think that's really important <laughs> uh, for the guys that know me personally they'll know that um well certainly when i was in university and, and clearly not doing any actual revision uh, I was quite into the gym and uh, and, and my fitness. Um, yeah. So like, what what's your plan? Have, have you gone down the whole uh, tracking what you're eating? Are you going down, you know, progressive overloads and and you know going really really granular yeah. with it, or are you just going? I'm, I'm going to do some some exercise, full stop. Bit a bit a bit of both. So I've done all that before and loved it, but in lockdown it was it was a, like one step too far when there was other things that I just felt like I needed to kind of think about and kind of just you know like just being a nice person when you're stuck inside the house 24 hours a day with, with your housemate you know who you'd normally only see for a couple of hours in the evening every day you know those things were important to me as well so I, I do progressive overload anyway. I do track what I eat, but I'm not as careful as I have been in the past. I'm not like, I mean, I'm meant to be tracking my macros, but let's be honest, it's not really. So, <laughs> the problem with it is, is my other hobby is baking and cooking. So it, they really go against each other. So I'm like baking a big fat chocolate cake and then I'm going outside for 20 minutes to kind of work it off. You know, it's that kind of, it's balanced. So yeah, you're stuck, you're stuck in stasis. Then there's there's no there's no regression, yeah. no progression. Almost. Yeah, basically, <laughs> I'm on maintaining at the moment. Yeah. Yeah, I th I think that's always a big issue is the the food and um, as you guys just saw just before in the in the break, uh, I have a little bit of a sweet tooth. I've never had a filling. I'm gonna put that out there. I've never had. No, a me filling. neither. I haven't so either. I'm I'm justified in my sweet tooth. There is a sugar in my tea and there is. Uh, some green and black chocolate on the side um but 
the issue that I come up against is when I'm not fully on the gym, I'm on and off. And there's yeah. no, there's for me, I like doing heavy stuff, like heavy yeah. weights. So I've managed kind of, I've got these perfect push up things. Yeah. Just <laughs> hiding out of the way, it's not supposed to be in shot. Um, so I, I do some of those and I was, there was a point where the start of lockdown, I was really, really motivated because I'd been going to the gym before when I was doing a hundred a day, I was doing, you know, bits and pieces doing, yeah. I was doing rows with the, the very small weights that we have at home. And then just over, as time gone on, people have been like, Oh, do you want to just jump on and play, play call of duty? Um, you know, yeah. for six hours. Uh, because, yeah, you know, where else but you're one of go? those, are you? Well, where else? I, I hadn't played Call of Duty or Xbox um, <laughs> for years, actual years, on the, until this point. I think there was the odd time here or there where, you know, in, in the holidays where I, I kind of picked up a new game. I was like, okay, yeah, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll just see what it's about. But then, you know, yeah. after a short while, you get bored. You know, you play for about a week or something. You're like, oh, I can't be bothered. And you just go out with friends or whatever but it's never been like this where you can't go out with friends you can't do the other things like i i just want to go to a restaurant again man uh i want to have a yeah. steak or just a coffee steak. shop i want to have some someone bring me a drink and uh, i'm sat there <laughs> virgin mojito and wait for my steak and chips to arrive and then i'll have some cheesecake yeah. or something but it'll be oh, all right then because it'll be all right then because <laughs> i can go to the gym uh whereas now it's like it's a little bit more difficult, isn't it? Yeah. So I am the same as you. Normally I go, like when I go to the gym, I go heavy. Like it's kind of all or nothing when I go. But this has been really nice because I, I physically, I don't have like a, a squat rack or anything like that in the garden. It's just like a barbell and some weights. But I can't do the things that I normally do because I can't lift it to kind of get into the right, the right kind of shape or anything. Like so the right it's it's been different but what it's given me is like it's made me realize that you can work out light and it's you still feel good which is something that's really important like you don't have to be the heaviest like you don't have to lift the heaviest you don't have to push yourself the hardest you don't have to do the most sets the most reps every single time you can just go out there get it done just do out you know average and that's fine you'll still make progress yeah, I I think that's almost you're in a lucky position being a girl because you don't have to do so so much of a heavy lifting yeah. thing to move. Uh, whereas yeah. I find that if I do the lighter weights, I'm having to do things like a hundred reps to feel something. Uh, yeah, which is a bit mental, but um, yeah, I, I I don't know if that's just physiology and and the way that we are compared to each other. I think that's that's an interesting thing, but yeah, something's better than nothing, isn't it? Hira, what have you been doing? You've been yeah. in, have you been in with the well, exercise? Or, uh, <laughs> I am like the, the least textbooks? active person. So my sister's been like trying <laughs> to get me to do exercise with her. She's been watching a lot of, you know, the Instagram live videos and she's got all these resistant bands and she's recently bought a yoga mat, but I'm the complete opposite. I'm such a couch potato when I want to be. I think like the extent of like my exercise has been going for walks. So I've really enjoyed just actually getting some fresh air at the start of lockdown. I was absolutely terrified. I felt like really anxious going outside. I was like, I just don't want to, but towards like this period that we're in now, I've been going out quite a bit. There's actually a funny story. So I went to my local park and I was just kind of chilling, walking around being quite mindful because mindfulness is something that I quite enjoy doing. And the next minute I know this deer just zooms past me, like a baby deer zooms past me and just jumps into the lake that's near me. And I was like, just frozen with shock. <laughs> like that was like a meter or so away from me. I could have been run over by a baby deer, but it was just the weirdest experience. And I was like, okay, it's time for me to go home now. No, but um, so for me, <laughs> exercise is a no-go and I know I need to exercise a bit more, but I just have never been active. I think for me, my the worst thing that I've been addicted to almost during lockdown is TikToks. My friend got me, my friend got me introduced to it back in Feb time. So she was telling me about and showing me all these TikToks. I was like, no, I'm not going to download TikTok because I'm going to get stuck in that rabbit hole. I'm going to just watch that and not go to sleep. And lo and, be, lo and behold, here we are a couple of months later, and I 
am obsessed with them. Like I tried making a couple myself, didn't end up being TikTok famous, which was a shame because that would have been excellent. I would have earned so much money from that. But yeah, it wasn't for me. Um, and I've been watching a lot of stuff on Netflix. So I know it's a topic that we're going to come on to a bit later, but I've been obsessed with really trashy TV on Netflix. I think it's just a bit of escapism for me. So I like my serious programs. Um, but the one thing that I've got a really guilty pleasure for is Selling Sunset on Netflix. I don't know if you guys have heard of it. No, I've not. I've heard of it, but I haven't watched it. Oh, yeah. I'm absolutely obsessed with it. Like I get, So it's about um, these women in... I think it's Hollywood and they're real estate agents and they're just selling these incredibly expensive but amazing houses and I'm like oh my gosh is this real life or is it uh, a drama it's actually it's a reality tv program so it's it's real but how much of it's real I don't really know but I do watch like serious things so what have I watched recently (laughs) I've caught up on um, my criminal minds which is coming in coming to an end and I've watched that since god knows how long i don't know if you guys watch that and i'm not really a massive fan of um game of thrones like that's not really for me i'm not a fantasy kind of person i prefer like my fbi type things yeah a bit of everything for me really. i'm yeah i'm a bit mixed i think i'm more of like a sit down and watch a movie kind of person than i'm not super into series um but I've actually been trying not to watch too much TV during lockdown because I find I stop. I just stop watching it. Do you guys do that? Like I'm watching it for like an hour and then it's just on and I'm wandering around like doing other things and I've just decided, you know, just turn it off. That's how it works, <laughs> really. Because normally, well, you guys have seen my setup uh, where I'll have yeah. something on my tablet and then I'll be doing all the bits and pieces I need to do for the online you know, the podcast, YouTube, Instagram, whatever it is, I'll be doing all that stuff on the side and I'm kind of like half an eye on what's going on. Uh, yeah. So I kind of know the general gist of what's going on, but I miss some of the conversations and, and like uh, maybe some of the key points of stories and things. But yeah. it's either that or sit in silence. So I'm much like, well, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll put <laughs> on. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think it's a strange one because again similar to the, the ps4 thing like what else are you going to do right now um i think i think that's the real issue because i'm someone that doesn't like to be sat at home generally like i like to have a yeah. plan and to be going off and doing something with my friends not, not it doesn't have to be something adventurous like going for you know hikes or you know things that some people do but even if it's just going to someone's house and having a, a chat for a few hours and then you know just talking about plans and future and you know yeah. whatever else is going on within you know each other's lives that I think that's kind of the the way that I normally spend my time obviously now you've yeah. kind of uh, you're stuck with um virtual methods or sitting outside and it's yeah. really pretty heavily these days so yeah it's pretty miserable yeah, today I mean the other that. the other day I um, actually went out into Manchester like the town city so like near the Arndale and everything and I met my best friend from uni and it was just so weird because I'm such like a not emotional but like I like giving people hugs and just like human contact and whatnot and I couldn't even give her a hug and I was like this is so weird like I just kept saying how weird it was because she was sat opposite me but I couldn't like give her a hug I haven't seen her for like months now and we were just talking about how everything was going and it was just really weird and I was like well is this going to be our new normal like are we allowed to hug people again are we are we allowed to do that and then what was frustrating me the most was the amount of people so you could see like the um the tram stop and people getting on the tram and no one was wearing face masks even though it's now compulsory to do so and I'm like no one's following any of the rules like what's going on do you think people believe it I not believe in the rules. Just... COVID. That's, that's, that's what I've come to the conclusion of. Uh, I don't know. I'm a bit of a stickler for the rules. Like, I'm one so of those I. people like, I just follow the rules for no reason just because you should. Um, but, yeah, from what I've seen, people just don't care. And it's like, I don't know. I think if we had a second spike, that would be obviously proof. But I don't know. I also think there's no, there isn't actually any proven evidence about the face mask on public transport. 
that I've seen that's super convincing that makes me think like that's definitely going to stop me getting it but yeah I'm not sure I, I think I'm a bit the same as you here like I tried not to really go out that much at the beginning like I was like if I'm at home and then I'm I'm safe exactly, yeah but to be honest most people that I know that had it were fine like they just had a bit of a cough or a tickle or you know in their throat so I don't know I don't know whether I was too worried about it and was over cautious or if you know it's so hard because I don't I barely know anyone that's had that's had it bad mm, I, I think that's that's the thing because the estimate has been that only five percent of the population have had COVID so far so the likelihood of you mm. knowing someone is very dependent on your location um yeah I think I think that's part of it. I, I I know of a few people who have had it, um, not people that I personally know, but it's it's people that I know of, as in like you know second second connections and things like that. Yeah, um, yeah. And there was a practice owner in Bradford, or well, the practice that I know of that he owns is in Bradford, and he he lives in Harrogate or somewhere, um, and he was on death's door, and he was a, oh, a pretty wow. big, he was a pretty big guy. Um, I'm not going to say overweight, but he was, you know, a little bit heavier than average, probably. And he's like a skeleton now. Um, wow, but, really? But he's alive, but you don't know what kind of a long-term impact it has on yeah. body systems, lungs, and, you know, all that kind of thing. So it's it's one of those that people in our age bracket aren't going to be too affected. Um, yeah, yeah. Plus My minus. biggest frustration is what I've seen on like social media so obviously we've had some of the most amazing like sunny hot days and you get people going I don't know where it was was it Brighton maybe Brighton Beach and it was absolutely packed yeah. people were like packed in like sardines and that really frustrated me because then you've got people then criticizing people going to like these protests for like the Black Lives Matter movement who were all doing it quite safely within two meters apart from each other wearing their face masks and those people getting criticized being like if we get a second spike it's going to be because of them and I was like well that's obviously not the case because you've had people celebrating for VE day there were people having street parties not my own street but like streets near me where they weren't socially distancing and then you've got people going to the beach and not socially distancing it's just a bit of a double standard there really and it's something that really really irks me yeah I, th I think yeah there's conversations I've had with patients over the phone where they were just like, it's a government hoax to control us and all sorts. And that's, that's quote unquote, that's not even, you know, me paraphrasing. Uh, so that there are sections of the community who really don't believe in, in what's being told and don't listen to expert advice as, as we're well aware, you know, with perio patients and the like, which was <laughs> one of my big, one of my hated things about dentistry was <laughs> I, I brought up yesterday. Um, but yeah, I, th I think you're right on the whole BLM thing um, because there is, I was going to say before you kind of went on to that point, there were, you know, people who are of uh, that sort of background, BAME backgrounds are more likely to be adversely affected by COVID. Um, so that's yeah. kind of one thing that I was, I was almost uh, alluding to there as well. But yeah, you're right. The, uh, the way that things have gone um, now with even, have you seen the thing about, um, cancellation of random TV episodes just because yeah. of BLM. No one's asked for that. It's just like a yeah, like yeah. gaslighting the whole sort of thing so that someone can get outraged because Faulty Towers is now, um, you know, no longer airing a certain episode. Um, just yeah. almost missing the point on purpose to wind people up and then set people against each other. And I think that's that's really worrying because. You yeah, because it's very accident. divisive. Yeah, you don't do that kind of yeah. accident. Um, so I, I, th I think that same sort of thing is running through the protests and and statues and things like that. Um, but I mean, if you look at the history of some of these statues, that one in Bristol was just I didn't I hadn't heard of it before because I, I no me neither. To, I try not to watch the news full stop. Like <laughs> yeah, never watch the news. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm, I'm of the opinion that if you can't change something, don't uh, don't pay any attention to it um yeah i think that's similar to the goals thing you were talking about molly you know I, I draw two big circles in my head and go things i can deal with and change things that i can't put them in one of the boxes or one of the circles ignore that side and then i deal with that side um yeah that's one of good those. way of doing it though 
that's one of the ways yeah. that, that I kind of work. But but obviously with everything going on, you do pay a bit more attention. And, and I just think it's crazy that there was still a statue of someone whose entire contribution to the world was shipping people on on ships from Africa to the States. And, yeah. and we were happy to have his statue up. I think that was pretty mental. Yeah. You just accept, like, in the past, you would have just accepted that that person contributed to society so they deserve to be there. You don't... You you wouldn't have questioned previously unless you were particularly knowledgeable on the topic, you know, and we, we should know those kind of things. I, you don't know what you don't know. That's like such a good quote, but it's really hard when it's brought to your attention in such a horrible way, you know, with the death of someone. And that is when you realize how much you don't know about the topic and like that for me I I was really trying to like figure out how I felt and like what I thought for such a long time it probably took me five days to even be able to understand my own thought process on the Black Lives Matter movement and then to put it into words and message people that meant a lot to me about the experiences that they've had that was even harder to kind of actually say like this is a problem and I understand that it's a problem but I'm so sorry I didn't realize that before and it you can't go back and say oh well everything I did then was right for the time even though there is a little part of that which I do believe in if that makes sense I hope it does you know I could I could only have acted on what I knew at the time I could have only acted on my education level at the time and now I've been more educated I can act accordingly but uh, yeah I think it, it's big I hope it makes big changes the thing that uh, I'm cautious about is that it there's no there is no easy answer and I think if there was an easy answer it would have been done five years ago ten years ago and I don't think there is an easy answer to how you can fix something that is institutional as institutional as institutional as this is as like this issue is mm. I think it's refreshing so to hear worrying, that though yeah yeah like, I think what's been so worrying is now you think well actually that guy did that in full view of knowing he was getting you know recorded and he was fully on camera uh and you just think yeah. what's going on when somebody isn't if they were yeah. to do that at that point what the heck's going on when people aren't on camera and you hear of these situations yeah. where, oh, the body camera was not working or the... Uh, it you know, fell off. It, yeah, it was, it was obscured by something. Uh, so then you wonder, well, what is being, what is being kind of uh, taught or uh, mm. being acceptable from higher up positions? And is there any sort of way that that institution can be let, allowed to, to kind of carry on? Mm. I think it's tricky because a lot of the examples that we've seen have been from the US and I don't know 100% that you can apply those same principles from the police force in the US to the police force in the UK. And like I have friends who work in the police and they are great human, human beings, you, you know, and they, you know, one bad in, individual doesn't make a collection of people bad. However, you know, we we do need the police in our society. And I think that is important to acknowledge that they're there for a reason and they're there for function and that we need to, it's balance. I just keep coming back to that. Like you have to find the compromise between good training, good regulation and equally from the other way, from the public, you know, changing perceptions and those kind of things yeah. I agree with you on that one but I think one of the things that's come out for me in regards to like the UK is the way that they show information and news outlets portray the news of people like Madeleine McCann who as unfortunate as it is that she's been missing for so long like that had more attention in the news than someone like Shukri Abdi who was a Somali mm -hmm. girl I think she was 12 or 13 years old and 
she was basically murdered and no one's done anything about that and that for me is really disheartening to see because there's evidence there was people there who witnessed it and nothing I didn't really hear a lot of it and it was about was it a year ago now if I'm yeah. correct and there wasn't really much of an uproar back then and even now like people are trying to raise awareness of it and I'm still seeing more in the news or more on social media about Madeleine McCann and it was just the other day actually so I think in Burnley it was so there was a football match going on and people were taking the need to kind of like protest and just stand in solidarity with Black Lives Matter and racism and everything like that and then just above in the air was a um all like is it all lives matter burnley and i was just worse shocked to see that. that i was like i think it was worse than that let me let me find it i think it yeah was like, i just really horrific. Horrific. yeah burnley, let me find it yeah i think that's the thing i think we are much better over here than than uh in the states it goes white lives matter burnley which yeah no, that's one, it. no one disagrees with but it's again just because it's intentionally missing the point and i think that's something that we yeah. see quite a lot of within how things are reported here uh so that is yeah. something that could change but then it comes down to you know who's in these positions of hiring people and who makes decisions of what editorial lines and stances are taken um mm -hmm. and you see that the whole way through you know general elections the way people are portrayed which is you know you might have a quote which is half half of what's been said to then outrage people or you know it, it's the, it's the whole sort of idea um behind how things are going on i think that's something that's quite worrying that we seem to be in a society where you would rather have a sound bite a 10 second sound bite than an actual conversation where you can understand what somebody's about yeah yeah uh, I think the, the difficulty with the whole situation is the kind of something that you guys probably are aware of, which is this concept of, of equality and equity and like the difference in what it actually means. And like, obviously, equality is great. Like you want everyone to have equal opportunity. But what that means is we need to be we need to focus more on this equity principle, which is that people that are less privileged or less like have less opportunity have are forced more opportunities to be able to get to those same positions. And for that, I think role models is so important. Like for me personally, I can't comment on BA ME, you know, from my perspective, but say um, as for female ro role models who I look up to, that's really important. And you do find in our industry that a lot of the role models are male and if you then translate that across to the BAME and Black Lives Matter then your role models are reduced even even more for, for these for this group and that I think is really sad it's so easy to put the right person in the right position to give the whole community a sense of voice yeah I, th I think it's it's interesting that whole idea of uh, giving opportunities and, and things like that. And I think if you look at and we'll take we'll take New York for an example because I know some of the numbers from there. They spend nine billion on policing a year, which is more than some countries spend on the, on their military. And I think that mm. alone is enough to kind of say actually well. I think it might even be more than nine billion. I might have got that number wrong, but it's 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 something which is more than you know most countries will spend on their actual military budgets and things like that. If you just say, actually, well, you've got a certain number of people who are disadvantaged, um, and there's been studies done where if you give a universal basic income, so people are no longer worried about where the next meal's coming from, where where the housing money's coming from, they're able then to just give themselves a leg up. And then they yeah. move forward from that. But it's always an actual, it's like universal. There's, there's uh, experiments done in Canada, in Canada in the 70s. Um, and the, the results were quite positive. Crime just dropped. Productivity went up because people are, are more s kind of self, self uh, they've got self-satisfaction or I don't know quite the right word yeah. for it, but 
there's some sort of stability in their lives and they're not worried security. about losing. Yeah, security. They're secure in the, in the housing, in the income, in, in the food. And a lot of the time, you almost can't, you can't, you can criticize, but you can't, you can understand where people are doing things, where they are stealing to get food. Because there are people who are in that situation where they haven't got any other option to, to be getting food for their family. And it's, it's one of those things that if you've been following football, uh, Marcus Rashford, he's been doing the whole yeah. food with the for, school yeah. vouchers. Thing. Um, and he's someone who relied upon that to actually eat when he was a child. Without that, he was going to be having, what was he saying, cereal with water or something like that. So yeah. that's no way for a young person to be to be getting on. Um, and in a, such a large country where we, you know, supposedly such a strong economy and very rich country and not in the third world and all those kinds of things, that's not the way that things should be done. Um, no. So I always, almost joke, but it's almost not a joke that maybe we are in the third world if people are going hungry. Well, this yeah. is the thing. My sister, she is a primary school teacher and she works in quite a deprived area in Manchester. And the amount of children that she sees that have to like, who just eat so much at like the breakfast clubs because they're not having enough food at home, it, it's alarming. And it really annoyed me how like Boris Johnson had promised like these school meals and school vouchers to primary school to then do a U turn and then do a U turn again because someone as affluent as Ma. Marcus Rashford had then been like no we need these and um, I know there was like promises of I think it's laptops and co computers for um, primary schools in order to like help them out during the Covid crisis and um, my sister she was telling me yesterday actually how um, her school is getting one of those one for I've no idea how many children she's got in that school but it's a large number and to have just one laptop given and I'm like well why they're making these promises that they're obviously not like delivering on and mm. i think you made a really good point there like we may on the out outside look like we're a very developed first world country but the amount of people that are living below the poverty line the amount of people that are on the welfare system and having to work multiple jobs to just make ends meet and just the general condition that people are living in and then it kind of comes to the point where you mentioned before that um ba BAME people are more at risk of like things like COVID-19 is it because of like the standard of living that they have because if you look at the statistics that they're, they're more likely to be in the um below the poverty line so is there a correlation between that and it's just baffling to me how we're living in 2020 and there's still such inequality within our country and within others where when you've got people like is it Jeff Bezos who's like making trillions and trillions of dollars and it, it just baffles me how like there's this top one percent of people who are controlling all the money and then the rest have so little yeah, mm. I, th I think there's I think there's something that's quite funny going on and, and not in the actual funny way in the that's not right sort of funny way um but again that's one of those things that comes in that circle of what can we really do about it um, exactly. which, which is the, which is the issue you know and that's almost maybe why you see this racism that comes up because if you can pit one against the other because it's not you know it, i mean there, there are people i'm sure who are more well off who have who hold these views and it's probably more subtle in those cases and you know, it comes down to who they hire and things like that. But uh, mm -hmm. I'm sure that if you remove those worries and, and that adversarial nature, you'd probably see much less friction between communities in that in that way. Yeah. It's a never ending topic, I, isn't it, guys? It is. <laughs> yeah. There's so many places you can go to with that conversation. Uh, yeah. It's really challenging as a as a white person in an environment like that to just take a step back and just accept like this is it's my fault and I didn't even know like no one goes out there actively as a white person to step out and be like well some people do I guess but I personally yeah, don't <laughs> <laughs> yeah I guess some people do I personally don't go out of my way to to create these situations. But the fact that I have benefited from it in some way, like it's taken this to make me realise it. And I think somehow probably everyone has always known this, but 
you've kind of said what can we do about it and now you're looking at it with a different mindset and saying I can do something about this or we as a community we can do something about this but it's not I, I can understand the resistance that white people might be feeling that that it's a difficult topic to talk about I can I can understand where that's coming from but we just have to kind of get over it that's we just have to and just accept it and and help that's it yeah the positive yeah go go on I was just saying the positive thing that's come out of it is like people like yourself Molly who've I've had people messaging me because I've been posting quite a bit on like my personal um Instagram account about like everything that's going on like Black Lives Matter the definitions of like microaggressions micro insults um and like what we can do is people just ordinary people and like signing petitions and I've had so many people just being like thank you for providing that information I'm like well it's it's not really my information you shouldn't be thanking me it's just out there like you just really need to focus on what you're looking at and there is a wealth of information out there and it's good to see that people I'm speaking to now are are aware of the privileges that they have because in the past when I broached the topic of like white privilege with friends they've just completely denied it and be like oh you're just making it into a race thing which that in itself is a microaggression like I've experienced it myself where like I've had people when I'm in an uber for example and they ask me oh what are you doing I'm like oh I'm a dental student and they kind of look at me like oh like your parents are like where are you from then I'm like oh from Manchester like your parents let you move out to do this degree like they didn't want you to stay closer to home and then they start asking like really personal questions like yeah but where are you actually from like where are your family from and that for me it's it's a really like it's it's a tough one for me to talk about because I don't mind people asking me I've had this conversation with Molly actually and other people and I don't mind people who know me quite well asking me where like my family background is from like I'm absolutely fine with that the issue for me is just when like random people that I've never met before in my life just like start to ask like oh but you're not actually from here and almost like deny my Britishness when I'm like just as British as the next person just because of the colour of my skin doesn't mean that I automatically have um, immigrated from another country but it's not to say that I'm not proud of my roots it's just frustrating for me because I'm like you don't really know me so how do you feel within your rights to ask that question and other personal questions like oh so where's your dad from and where's your mum from like I find that really bizarre like I don't know if you've ever experienced Molly where people are like where are you actually from like tell me about your family background no no like never the the only experience I think I would get in terms of a racist point of view is when I used to work at my old practice and uh, my uh, people would come to reception and say oh I don't want to see a foreign dentist and I was the only white dentist in that practice and they would be booked in with me and I was I don't want to <laughs> I don't want to see them <laughs> like you know that's not what I'm about you, you know that's not what I'm about I'm not here to encourage that behavior obviously you, you know you have for some you know sometimes you do have to see people that you don't want to see but yeah that's probably my only experience of any you know I just don't have the same experiences as you like my pet no one asked me where my parents are from no one asked me about my family history not that I know it but you know cultural values no one asked me those you know it's yeah it is completely different I get asked a lot about like my religion so I'm a Muslim and um I get people asking me so oh so when are you getting married like you're of the marriage marriage age and I'm like I have a life ahead of me like I'm only 23 for Christ's <laughs> sake like I want to like work on my career like and then and then I'd have like patients being like oh I can set you up and I'm like I don't want to be set up like this is completely inappropriate and I've had when I used to work at my part-time job um I'd have people being like oh I didn't expect you to be Pakistani I thought you were Indian or you're really fair skinned for so and so or you're really pretty for someone who's brown and that is such a it's not even a compliment it's it's so insulting to hear because I I don't know if you're so insulting for a yeah. short girl or something. No, not so so attractive for a short girl or whatever, you know, whatever it might be. Um, yeah, I think that's just, I think that's just poor manners full stop uh, almost in a yeah. way as well. Um, but Molly raised an interesting point earlier about when she was working within practice where she was the only kind of um, Caucasian working there. 
and I, I think it would be really interesting to do a study on almost complaint rates when when you have and I know this this is something that I'm aware of because I know people who own pra- you know medical practices or dental practices and or are in, involved in the the running of these places and they always say they have to have the white face on the door otherwise the, oh, really yeah so there's a, there's an actual thing within kind of BAME circles who are running these places that they they know they need to have a white manager or a white receptionist who greets and meets the patients you know when they come to reception otherwise the complaint rate just goes through the through the ceiling almost really um, oh wow it would be really interesting if someone actually did a full kind of study or you know report on the difference between it because it's that underlying bias that's not spoken until you get an opportunity to complain anon- anonymously or to the DLP or someone like that, mm-hmm. that you then see actually, well, there is something going on here and it's not just that's a bad dentist because that there is the case there that there are bad dentists out there. Yeah. And, you know, that's yeah, for sure. Across all, uh, across all communities and backgrounds and stuff like that. I think there was something similar when you looked at pass rates where there was a, a, a face-to-face component now those people might have deserved to fail, but who's to say that there weren't people from another background who also deserved to fail, but were given the benefit of the doubt due to mm. an inherent bias that you know people were unaware of, but what happened? Yeah, I think I, that's just yeah, it would be really interesting to find out if anyone did that study. Yeah, I would be. Yeah. I, I, it's difficult where does the where does the line where do you draw the line like could i refuse that patient i you know i love refusing um, patients so i don't know <laughs> <laughs> I someone, we're going to speak to someone soon but uh, you're not you're not gonna i'm not gonna say who it was but um he goes the best thing about moving off the nhs is you get to say which patients you do and don't see you see them for the first time yeah you go i'll do that work for you or like or you quote you if you're a bit unsure you just quote them really high and go well for this yeah. to be worth it for me okay it's going to be you know one and a half times what i normally what i normally charge or something but that's up to you to say whatever that that price is going to be or or you can equally just say i, th- I think you're better off somewhere else whereas we don't yeah. get that legal hit within the nhs to say you know do one <laughs> you can go it's, yeah it's, it's impossible <laughs> basically well, even in dental school, you didn't get that. Like, there's been so many instances where I've heard from friends. Like, it's not happened to me personally, but um, one of my friends was treating a patient and she was saying how racist the patient was, like, just outright being um, completely roasting, yeah. like, the previous student that they had who happened to be of an Asian background and saying some really horrific things. And it's just, it's it's really disheartening for me to see, like, how are these patients still qualifying for free treatment when they're going to be treated by people of an Asian or a black background and then to then go around and say to other pay, um, other students that they've had some horrible things about them and it's like why aren't these patients being like crossed off the list like mm. it makes no sense to me like I'm sure you can do that in a dental hospital where you have the right to refuse people treatment um, so why is that not happening and um, it's actually really interesting so this group that I'm a part of um, as part of like this racism thing that we're doing at the dental hospital in Birmingham, um, a little study was carried out actually. And um, it was a really good um, little survey that um, one of the students did. And she was just asking about um, experiences of racism or like microaggressions that people have experienced. And one that like kind of hit home to me was um, um, some students who'd come back from praying. Um, Because obviously as a Muslim, you pray pray five times a day. And there was some really devout Muslims in my year who obviously did their five prayers a day. And um, when they came late into lectures, they'd be shouted at by the lecturer being like, you're being inconsiderate of my time. And then that being cut off from like the... um, so we have this recording system called Panopta that records the lectures and then that not being recorded. So obviously they didn't really have a leg to stand on if they wanted to complain about that. It's just really like frustrating to not to see that people who are slightly different or have like different religious beliefs aren't really being um, considered. But it's also inclusive of like people um, observing Ramadan during the holy month where people are fasting and um, exams being placed there like ones that are like OSCEs which can be quite strenuous and go on for a longer period of time and it's just things like that aren't really being considered and when people wanted to get time off for Eid for example they were like well you can only have this day off because you've got you can't miss clinics 
So yeah. Oh, I was I was pretty bad for that. I, if I was going to take a day off, I just took it. <laughs> but, yeah. I, th- I think that's I think that's the thing though, isn't it? Because um, you'll know as well as I will that there's it, there's not an option to miss that that prayer if it comes, and it, it's not like you can defer it. There is no option to miss it. Um, and you know, it's not like you you go out to be in in someone's way. Um, so I, th- I think that is definitely something that. You know, it's just life. You you need to find a, a balanced way and to stop being rigid and all in all aspects when you have got the option just to let things slide. And I think that's I think that's a lot of the problems in a lot of the world is people don't like to um, they don't like to accommodate other people. They they want it it's, it's their way or no way. Um, yeah. And then even if people like speak out about it, they're like, well, we're not going to change all the rules for you. I'm not asking for you to change the rules. It's just like be aware that I might be a bit late because I'm doing a prayer or I might not be in because I'm celebrating Eid, which is like almost as big as Christmas in the Christian calendar. So it's just frustrating when people are like, well, we're not going to follow the Sharia law and put every and it's just like such backwards racist mentality. And it's like no one's asking you to change everything for us. We're just saying I want a day off to celebrate with friends and family. Yeah, um, I think Molly brought up something really interesting as well when she was talking about the, um, was it was it here? I, th- I think you brought up the patients who said bad things towards you know students, but it's not yeah. it's not just racism because I had a clinician who came over to check my work one time, um, and she was leaning across to pick up something. This is a white blonde lady, and this patient just started making you know very adverse sexual remarks like oh don't mind if I do because you know obviously I'm left-handed and she was right-handed she was reaching across on the other side to pick something up and I just thought how what, you know we, we kind of didn't say anything because what can you say you're halfway through doing I don't know what whatever the treatment was now it's this is like six seven years ago that it happened but you know the actual incident as opposed to the treatment sticks in the mind um, but how can you do anything about that and it, there was no option for us to go you can't see this guy again um, mm. and then you know it's it's really really difficult because obviously you try and do the best and everything like that and then for someone to be treated like that in front of your face even though you're just a student and that's the person yeah. who's supervising you you know that's that's pretty mental yeah definitely I think as a woman in dentistry some like as a dentist um, like casual sexism is quite an issue as well because patients would come in and see me and and say where's the dentist like as a you know like only women women can only be the nurses um or yeah when you ask when you tell friends of or fa- friends family members that you're a dentist or you're a dentist or, or a dental nurse and it, I just don't feel like my male like peers would have the same response if they told them that um it's not something that like affects me day to day, but there's definitely, you know, part of your life where you think like, why do people think that? And in this kind of conversation, you, you know, what can we do to change it? Like the majority, I would say the majority of my year was female, probably 60, 40 yeah, female. Yeah, same so, with mine. Yeah, I don't, I don't really see where this um, kind of attitude that women can only be nurses um, comes from, you know. Maybe it's old-fashioned, I don't know. It is very old-fashioned. Like, again, drawing back to the Uber experiences, I'd be, like, I'd be, re- like, running late and I'd get an Uber instead of walking the 30 minutes to the dental hospital. But then they'd be like, oh, so do you work at the dental hospital? I'd be like, yeah. And they're like, oh, are you a nurse there? And I'm like, I, not that I have anything against anyone being a nurse, but, like, why is it so, so shocking to people for a woman to be in, like, a career like dentistry or medicine without being automatically classed as a nurse or the receptionist and it's really frustrating like I've had um experiences of people being like oh I want to I don't want to be treated by a female I want a male for example in oral surgery because they seem to think that men are stronger but it's not necessarily yeah. strength it's technique in oral surgery and it's it's really baffling and then I've had like really big burly men being like are you sure you can take teeth out because I'm quite small and petite and I'm like I'm I'm pretty like not qualified but I've taken teeth out before and I'm sure I can take them out on you like don't worry 
and it's, it's just mental they wouldn't ever say that to like one of the guys so why do they think it's okay to say it to me yeah it makes you just doubt yourself like what's yeah what's wrong with me <laughs> what like, nothing me? wrong with me i can take out teeth it's fine yeah definitely yeah i think it's almost a never-ending sort of issue is uh, the problem is it's not our problem or your problem it's somebody else's issue that they're then throwing onto everyone else and it's very difficult to kind of um combat without long-term changing of attitudes uh mm. and, and once someone's been grown you know grown up in that sort of mentality you almost nine times out of ten aren't going to be able to turn them around um so that's that, i think that's the the sad thing about it isn't it um, yeah but we're coming up to again 50 minutes which was crazy <laughs> Um, this is just it, yeah. Away. I, th- I think once you get once you get a roll, it just rolls on and on. And you just uh, yeah. you forget the time. Um, <laughs> so I think I won't take much more of your you guys' day. Uh, if you've been listening, please follow Hero. Where can we find you? Um, so my new Instagram account, which is at Dr. Hero Jamil, um, it's posted like my journey with like mental health and well-being and just top tips for people applying for dental school. And Molly, where can we find you? Yeah, so I don't have a dental Instagram um, at the moment, but it's just my name, Molly Deakin. And uh, there is something in the pipeline coming through uh, from me on the dental side of things, but it's not it's not in fruition yet. Yeah, uh, and that's Deakin with a Y, not an A, because I got that wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and guys, I'm everywhere, so you know where I am. Uh, <laughs> apparently, I can't I'm get rid of you. <laughs> um yeah thank you all for for joining us uh and for the guys who are listening at home if you're on spotify or apple podcasts you can actually give a review on spotify but if you're an apple podcast please drop a review in there uh supposedly it's really helpful um follow hot pot podcast which is the podcast only news there's dense of insta which is lots of people news uh and my personal one which is me news uh, if you've been enjoying things, have a little look at the links in my bio to see how you can support what I'm doing. Uh, but thank you guys for joining. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Fun. <laughs> <Awesome>. <laughs>